the world and you take what you see. Everybody! First question goes that what actually got you into metal music at first place? Do you recall hearing metal for the first time? Um, uh, metal for the first time? No, I mean, I don't really. Um, I got into the Beatles when I was really young, and I remember being really into the, like, the, like, the heavy riffs, you know, the kind of, like, the, the riffs that were uh, just a little darker, you know, using uh, minor, you know, m minor chords or, or like, uh, you know, minor progressions as opposed to, you know, the major happy progressions. It's kind of the music that just kind of called to me. Um, and then I got into symphonic music. Um, and I found that, you know, a lot of heavy themes come from symphonic music. Um, I didn't really know it back then, you know, I didn't really know that that was heavy music that I loved, but it was, uh, you know, it, it was just the, the darkness of the music that called to me. And then, um, yeah, I remember what, like, I heard Alice in Chains for the first time. I heard uh, Nirvana. I heard, um, man, like Black Sabbath, you know. Uh, Ozzy, Ozzy was being played on the radio at the time. Then there was like Depeche Mode, stuff like that, and then uh, you know, um, and then Corn came into my life, and you know, at the same time Corn was was there. It was uh, you know I was I had a best friend who wanted to listen to heavy and hardcore music, and we went and found like our, the the heaviest records we could find, and he he grabbed Tomb of the Mutilated from Cannibal Corpse, and I grabbed. Um, Pierce from Within from Suffocation. Okay. And, and it was like, it just kind of like progressed from there. But I mean, I guess, like, I mean, the reason I can't really recall is because it, it all just kind of steamrolled. You know, I love music. That first of all, I love music. So I love pop music. I love everything. And metal just called to me because I'm more inclined, you know, from an early age to like, you know, the, the, the heavier stuff, the, the darker tones and you know, the more dissonant and, and, and then minor noises. So how did you become a vo like metal vocalist? What's the story behind that one? Um, I was a trombone player, uh, in, in high school and man, I just kept seeing, you know, all these people, these singers, these front men, you know, Lane Staley, um, Scott Whelan, uh, you know Jonathan Davis, Fred Durst, uh, you know people like that. They were just like larger than life. You know, you're just like, holy man, these people are doing something for humanity. These people are like giving life to people that are lifeless. And I don't know, that just made me want to be in a band. It made me want to like write music and and share that with people because I felt that I had it inside of me too. You know, I felt like I had some stuff that I needed to get out. And, uh, y yeah, f from there, I just, you know, I, I, I played trombone. Singing kind of came easy to me because it's the same kind of thing. It's trombone and the voice are very much uh, almost identical because it's not, there's no, like, set buttons that you press down in order to achieve a note. You know, you have to find the note. You have to use your ear and... That to me was always really interesting. It was something that you know challenged me. It, I felt like um, you're almost like a fretless bass or like a fretless guitar in your in your voice. So to like to be able to find the notes is something that um, that always interested me. Um, also, like growing up, my mom was always a singer, um, so I, will, I was always going to like her choir practices and you know I was meeting her you know her. Um, her instructors and whatnot, and I was always trying to be in the choir, adult choir, as a kid, you know. So um, I was also, you know, in in theater. You know, I did I did mu musicals and stuff when I was a little little kid. Um, so it just kind of always was in me, you know. Like it was, uh, you know, being a singer was always something that that I was inclined to do. So was Gunmetal Grey or All Shall Paris your like first proper metal band that you joined? Uh, no, I was, uh, I did, you know, a high school band and 
And then right out of high school, I was in another band. And then, you know, I was in I was in a, a bunch of bands, you know, n nothing of notoriety, nothing that ever made it anywhere. It was just, you know, garage bands. Um, so, like, as far as professional, yeah, I guess you could say Gunmetal Grey was my first. I don't think Gunmetal Grey was anything but an amateur band, honestly. Uh, you know, we never really, we got signed, but it was to an amateur label. It was a, a very small, small in 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 the independent label uh so to me i would say that my first real like professional you know touring metal band is is all shall perish for sure so when you joined like all shall perish did you have like some certain vocalists that you looked up to and were you like sort of first tried to mimic them when you are sort of figuring out your own way to sing and and do like more extreme type of vocals in uh when i was doing gunmetal gray i i kind of found this like high high pitch vocal of mine like the the one that i've you know honed up over the years and gotten a lot more shrill but um yeah at, at, at first like chuck shoulder um i i thought his highs were out of control um you know i was listening to like a lot of carcass a lot of like old man's child at the time um danny filth you know, like it, it just uh, those crazy, crazy highs that he could get. I was, I, I was always like, I needed to be able to do that. Um, as far as like my screaming though, I was always really like, I thought like the end all be all vocalist of like who I thought like screaming wise. I, I, I was like, okay, this is these are this is the type of screaming that sounds insane and super good. Is um both Corey Taylor and and Randy from Lamb of God. Uh, Corey Taylor and Randy Bly, like both those vocalists at the time um, when I was starting out was just like, that's what I wanted my like thick, my normal screaming voice to be like. And then I wanted to have the highs as like a, you know, as like a sprinkle on top. Um, <laughs> and then uh, it just turned out that that's wh where my my strength is, you know, my highs are where my strength are. So, uh, you know, nowadays I use that a lot more. But when I first started, you know, I really wanted this like meaty kind of like hardcore, thick, like natural scream voice. And, um, you know, the, things happen the way they happen. You know, the, you gain inspiration from somebody, you try to emulate your inspiration, and then you come up with your own sound. I think that that's, that's, I think, the biggest thing that I learned throughout the years. So were you losing your voice a lot when you started like sort of mimicking them or, or were you like natural talent that you had the voice like immediately almost? Um, the way I used to describe it, uh, so I never really lost my voice. It was, um, th like I said, the way I would describe it is, is it's like, you're like building a callus, you know, how like when you're playing, playing the bass, you know, you, you, your, your fingers get raw and, and they, you know, you have to develop a callus in order to be able to play, you know, um, it's kind of the same, the same thing in the voice, except you're not actually tearing and building calluses you're just strengthening the muscles so i didn't know that back then so i would just call it that um so like i would sing until your voice gets tired and then your voice gets tired and you get a little hoarse you know and then you know you take a couple of days rest and you go back at it and then eventually you don't need as much rest in between you know eventually you could just go day after day after day of doing the same thing and eventually you know that got to the point where um my band was like okay cool we're recording you know five, you know seven songs in two days let's go and okay and then you because you've been practicing because you've been going at it you know your voice is just kind of naturally there um i probably did you know like uh i i wouldn't call it hurt my voice but like i did you know train it so i mean when you're training it you, it's the same thing as like working out you know if you you go to the gym you're going to be sore the next day you know then you get and the recovery time gets less and less the stronger you get and that's that's kind of the same thing so what kind of memories do you have when it comes to like proper first proper tour that you did were you already like ready then or did you have to like learn the live on the road like oh no it was i was man i'm i'm different man i <laughs> I uh I didn't want to be home. I I wanted to be on the road. So mentally, I was prepared. Um, that and, and I start off with that because that's probably the hardest thing about being on the road is, is 
being mentally there because yeah. a lot of people, you know, they miss home, you know, to me, the first batch of years of touring, they're just like a snap. It was like, I would drive, I would show up, I'd play a show and it'd be over. And it was, I was so excited and so fueled up that nothing stood in my way. It was like, I just wanted to be there. I wanted to play. I wanted to sing. And that was that. And the, the years leading up to going on tour, man, I was practicing, you know, two sets a day. Like we were practicing, bro. Like, like you okay. show up to the room, you show up to the room, you have a couple of beers, you practice, you you you, you do your your you know your six seven song set, you know half hour forty five minute set. You take a break, have another beer, and then get <laughs> right back to it. And it's and it's like, if you're not practicing like that right now, and you're not in a band, or if you're not practicing like that, and you're in a band and you're trying to get started, you need to be doing twice a day. Like. I preach that shit because think about it. It's stamina. You go on stage, you start going crazy. If you haven't practiced your set twice through, how do you expect to get through your set once when the adrenaline is pumping, when there's people in front of you, when you're being judged and you don't even realize that you're being judged, you're judging yourself, all these things that come into play the moment you go on stage. And it's like, these are things that still happen to me to this day, bro. Like, I still get nervous before I go on stage. I still have to warm up before I go on stage. I still have to cool down before I go on stage. It these are things that like from day 1 to to now, I mean we're talking 15 years of of touring. Those things never go away. So if you're not prepared on day 1, you're fucked. Like I mean yeah, you you will learn it along the way and you can get better, but there's no point in beating your head against the wall, you know what I mean? You should be sitting in your practice room when your band hasn't done anything, when you haven't even even recorded anything. Write your music and sit and practice that music as much as you humanly can because that's the only way you're going to sound good in front of other people is if you know every trick, every corner, every sound, every note. If you know that by heart, then nobody can fuck with you. So are there like some specific warm-up routines for you that has remained the same from the early days or have they like changed also during your career? Um, I've picked up different techniques. Um, you know, I, I gotta I gotta tip my hat to Melissa Cross. You know, I before her I had my warm ups and um they were good, but they were not as uh in depth as the stuff that she can really provide. Um One thing I will say for starting singers is, and one of the things that's the most important is get yourself some lessons. Like, get 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 a teacher, get a tutor. You know, talk to your favorite friend who's already in an established band. Like, do something to gain some knowledge, because there's things that you just don't know that you might do to your voice that you might regret later. Um, for me, I had years of training. You know, I. Like I said before, like I was in choir, I was in, you know, theater. You know, th I did those types of things before, which helped me all with the understanding. Plus, I did music, so I, I already understood how to read, write music. So for me, I had this like background, this like foundation that a lot of like kids that I'm seeing nowadays don't really have, or they don't really have the patience for. So what I'm saying is, I go to a t go to a teacher, have them teach you the basic principles of like breathing. Um, the basic principles of of stretching your voice, because those are things that I was doing naturally. And when I say that, you know, you know, a warm up technique for me always has been going from your lowest voice to your highest voice, and then back down, all in one, all in one sitting. So, uh, and you do that, and then you in in there, you can f already find where the trouble parts are. You know, like, hey, this part is not so warm. This This part of my voice isn't vibrating the way that I would need it to vibrate. So let's work on that. So you just sit and uh, 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 yeah, okay. So that, that that's that's one thing. And actually, I've I've learned throughout the years that that is a strengthening te technique. That's a strengthening exercise. Um, to go from your lowest point to your highest point and then back down, it teaches your muscles control and like really really specific control so it so it actually helps you strengthen the muscles way up high and strengthen the muscles way up low so your voice is getting higher and lower at the same time 
it's actually an interesting warm up because it's a warm up and exercise. Um, I also do breathing techniques, um, which this is a, one of the things that I've learned from Melissa. Melissa, Melissa, um, from Melissa um, is learning to breathe. Is she calls it above the pencil, and that's where I mean you literally take a pencil and you put it on your mouth, and your the point is to try to breathe. Try to aim the breath above the pencil so that when you're singing, you're using your diaphragm and and using your diaphragm for support. Because a lot, what a lot of people don't realize is that when they're pushing air up, up above into the top of their skull, they're, they're learning how to project. Um, so you have breath control, that, that's one thing that I exercise during my warm-ups, um, you know, voice control and then um when i'm on tour and i'm really tired you know your voice starts getting tired on tour um there's these there's a i don't know the name specifically but it's a you just kind of go into your fry voice um so like uh okay and if and when you're doing that you're you're massaging your vocals at that point um so if if you're so on the road People say you lose your voice. You don't lose your voice. What happens is your the, the flaps of your vocal cords get swollen. Um, you know, they, they you you you're using your voice. Therefore when it gets tired, it's just swollen. And a lot of times that that fry kind of like normal vocal will just massage the flaps so that they can kind of come down and swelling. Um, you know, a anti-inflammation diet on tour, um, Tylenol, Advil, all that stuff helps, um, helps the vocals. And if it gets really bad, go to a ENT and they'll give you steroids. <laughs> <laughs> so are there like some specific foods or drinks that you wouldn't rather have before the show that you have felt that they affect your vocal cords somehow? Uh, anything sugar, um, okay. you know. A Coca Cola is awful. Um, a lot of people like milk before going on tour, or before going, you know, recording. And I found that milk is uh, also damaging. It, it doesn't really help. Um, you know, a lot of people like the the teas and stuff like that. But I find that like changing the temperature of your of your vocal cords is uh, is not beneficial um, unless you're resting. You know, after the show, drink some tea and don't talk to anybody. But, um, you know, during the show, just try to keep, you know, room temperature water. Um, if, you know, even cold water can freeze up your vocals. So, you know, on stage, it's it's room temperature water unless it's like a hot, hot show. If it's a super hot show, I try to have some cold water to try to balance. But, yeah, um, the the biggest thing is it's like, don't change the temperature of your of your voice you change the temperature of your voice you're you know you're expanding the molecules or you're shrinking the molecules it's basic science you know? so obviously you have released like three albums with all sharp Paris and three albums with suicide silence and the upcoming album remember you must die is gonna be your fourth one so is there like some specific album that you can pinpoint that has been like vocally for you like the most important one? Um, I would say, you know, Awaken the Dreamers, uh, All Shall Perish was probably like my, my most expansive, like uh, the, you know, the, where I covered every, every at ratio of voice that I have. I did everything that I could possibly do on that record. Um, and then, um, I think that the self-titled Suicide Sounds record was extremely important for me as far as like writing music and trusting myself and, and you know taking risks um because that's one thing I, I i wasn't really doing in my career was taking risks musically and um i i think that 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 record specifically helped me like come out of my shell even as a producer like writing music you know i've become a lot more of a riff writer and you know a, a, a music writer as opposed to you know just vocals um after that record so i think those two records were really important they were very experimental, both of them. Um, you know, Awaken the Dreamers, All Shall Perish is 
you know, there's everything on that record. You can, from Rob Halford, you know, vocals to, you know, hypocrisy. Um, it's just, they, they cover the whole thing, and, you know, to, to neurosis. Um, so it's, for me, that record is, is, is that, and then also that the self-titled, for, for the reasons I said. So are there like some specific tracks on Remember You Must Die that you're like most proud of, that you feel that you are doing like something new and different with your vocals, for example? Uh, I, no, I don't. I mean, just I mean to be real with you, no, this record is not new or different. It's 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 suicide silence. It's um, the what I what I'm most impressed about the vocals on this record is how raw they sound, how real they sound. Um, yep, agree. I, I had a really good time recording with Taylor. Um, he was somebody that um, he didn't overwork my vocals. Um, and by overwork, you know, a lot of people don't realize that, uh, you know, when you go into the studio, a producer is going to want the best take from you. And a lot of times producers will get in your head and they'll, they'll, you'll get a good take and you're like, all right, cool. This is done. And they'll be like, no, we're not done yet. And they'll get more and more and more and more and more and more out of you without needing it. They'll keep that first take that you liked that first one but they'll just keep making you sing and keep making you sing and while that's cool because it gets you kind of aggravated and then you're just like you know you're just fuming and you're on like on another level you know you, you get to this emotional state that's cool and all but sometimes you know just letting the performer perform is the best ticket because you're gonna get you're gonna get something that's real you're gonna get something that's raw you're not gonna get a fabricated feeling just for the take it's like it's the difference between creating like an indie film and a you know a, you know a kubrick film you know it's like you know the kubrick films you know that there you can tell there's a lot of passion from the actors but the you know the films kind of lack in in, in in gusto and in feeling as to where like a, a raw indie you know death metal record it just has all the feelings naturally it's like the band is just doing what they wanted to do what they were meant to do so for me, I think that that's kind of what I took from Taylor is, is just like, man, I don't think, I don't think we have more than three takes on this record. I, everything that I did was one or two or three takes, like okay. the whole record. It's, it's all very raw. I mean, it'd be like, yeah, yo, that sounded really good. Did you like that, Eddie? Yo, actually, I think I could do a little bit better. And, and we do it once more and then it'd be like, yeah, you know what? That was not better or that was better. And that would stay. And that that was the whole record, man. I mean, I I didn't take more than four like more than four hours for one song. Like, I, I I'm sorry, more than two hours for one song. It was it was wild. Like usually it's for me it's a four it's a four hour to eight hour day. Like it, doing one or two songs, it's four to eight hours. Like easy. This was I, I wasn't spending more than four hours for the whole session. So it, that that to me was I think it, it got a lot more of the like I said the raw feeling like the the what what people like about suicide silence you know just like that it's like almost like a punk rock feeling garage band feeling yeah this album definitely has it yeah and i mean I have... and then and that's that that to me is the that to me is the kind of the selling point of this record is is that it's it's a return to the the old school deathcore that that we are you know that we started that we that we all had a part in playing so I have two questions left, and the second last one goes that what were your parents' reactions when they heard first time that you have joined a metal band and started to scream your lungs out? Oh man, my mom, my mom's very religious. Uh, you know, she was she was very Catholic, so I, I was raised very, very Catholic. And uh, man, I I could just say that like her reaction at first was you know was uh wary you know she 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 was worried for me she she wanted to make sure that i wasn't you know aligning myself with the devil and all these things um but as as the years came um you know i think once she started seeing that the that the music was actually fulfilling for me and it was actually giving me more purpose and um creating me you know making me into a better man I, I think once she realized that she, it kind of clicked for her. And um, I remember on my first tour, she came with the whole family and she made, had shirts made 
that said like um, you know uh, you know Eddie's biggest fans uh, like all the, all this stuff so my mom went from being like I don't know if I support this to like one of my biggest supporters um uh, she's one of my biggest fans and you know I I'm very grateful for that because I know too many musicians out there that question themselves and are you know that that m sometimes even give up on their dreams because they don't really have supportive people behind them and uh that's really sad because a lot I've seen a lot of talent um you know turn into the UPS delivery drivers <laughs> um so it's it's a uh, it's 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 um something that I cherish very much is my mom's support last question any advice you would like to give to a young metal vocalist who is just about to start their journey um so much advice there's so much i could say man um if i were to if i were to pick best one if i were to pick one if i were to pick one thing i would say everyone's going to tell you that you can't everyone's going to tell you that you won't and if this is really for you if these words reach you know that you can and you will and that's it thanks a lot and thanks a lot for taking the time to do the interview okay. with me of course man. Oh. after a couple of minutes of seeing your face i i, I totally remember our interactions <laughs> yeah okay yeah, yeah, okay yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. What was the, what was the name of that festival, man? Uh, we've been we've been talking in Tuska, then we've been talking Tuska. in Numirok. That was in the middle of the forest. Oh, no, Numirok, that was the one. Yeah, yeah, we are. We talked like Num for hours there. Yeah, Numirok. You uh, remember we you took me and James to the um, to the sauna. You walked yeah. us over. Yep. And then we, and then that was, dude. I still remember that to this day. We took. <laughs> and I don't care if you put this in the interview. We. We did one of the coolest things I ever did, which is go into a wood made outdoor sauna, handmade sauna, then jumped into negative one degree water water. And it was bro, it was better than cocaine. And that's all I'm gonna say. Have a good day. <laughs> hey, thanks a lot, Eddie, and hope to see you in Finland someday with the sure, album. man. Oh, uh, we miss Finland very much, man. Uh one of the best places uh, for suicide silence and for all shall perish uh, finland has always shown me specifically a lot of love so thank you guys um we hope to come back very very soon thank you a lot for the chat yeah, take care good morning or yeah you too <laughs> yeah night time it's actually 7 p.m here so yeah bye -bye. take care bye